Hello friends and welcome back to the Hall of Craft! I'm... why did I clap? Ah, oh, fuck. I'm back with another video for you guys. And today, we're heading back to the crafting table to make this. A modular fire pit with roasting boar on a spit. Delicious! After my last video where I spent so much time on back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back painting sessions on Maldrakar back there, uh, link in the top right if you missed that video, I was craving something a little bit different, and honestly I really just wanted to get back to crafting, and I was really craving cutting some XPS foam. So that's what I wanted to do with today's video, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to make, but I kind of noodled around until I came up with this. This is a neat little relaxing, low pressure kind of build, and I've made sure to keep it very generic so that I can get good mileage out of it in my D&D games. Now because it is so generic, I could see myself using this in quite a bunch of different scenarios. Uh, you know, like an orc camp they would be roasting a boar. I've carved it in such a way that I think it could be like in a hall of dwarves or even just in, you know, your generic run-of-the-mill tavern. And then if you remove the spit from it, now it's just a long fire pit. Maybe it's a forge, maybe it's some kind of flame sacrificial altar or, you know, something like that. So I think that this could get a uh, a ton of different uses because of the way that I've made it so I'll just kind of take you through it. So the basic pieces to start out this build are my light sources for the flames and these are just three cheap tea lights. I'm just gonna take them and trace them out in a line on a scrap piece of two inch thick XPS foam. Then using my ruler I draw a frame around my tea lights with about a half inch of extra space around the sides. Then using my sharpened kitchen knife, I cut the foam away from the rest of the scrap to make the maneuverability a little bit more manageable. Now it's time to bust out my hot wire cutter. I'm using it here because I really want to get as perfect of a rectangle as possible. You could totally do this with a knife and a lot of patience, but I find I get these kind of straight cuts much more reliably when I use my hot wire cutter. Speaking of reliability, I messed that one up anyway, so I started over with a new scrap piece of foam. This one is a little bit bigger to give me a little bit more room for error on my cuts. This time I'm using the base railing that comes with the procs on to help my cuts go smoother. I should have been doing that from the start anyway. After I cut it out, I noticed that it was a little crooked along the top. So I just trimmed it down to size to try and make this thing as close to perfect as possible. I'm also using this opportunity to trim my block down so that it's not quite as thick. I want this thing to be taller than the tea lights uh, so that it hides them, but also not so tall that it doesn't let the flames show. Once I'm happy with that, I retrace out the tea lights onto my block. And then I use my Proxon to cut out the middle areas where the tea lights will eventually go. I'm not exactly sure why I had such shaky hands while doing this step. <laughs> they got pretty janky as far as some of the cuts were concerned, but it's not such a big deal because this is on the inside and nobody really sees that part of the build anyway. Once that's done, I test fit the tea lights and they slide in like a glove, so no harm, no foul. Next, I'm just gonna use my pliers to remove the flames from the top of the tea lights. Now I can take some dollar store foam core with the paper mostly ripped off and I trace my block onto it with a quarter inch lip around the sides. This is going to function like a tabletop for my fire pit. Then using an X-Acto knife I will bevel the edge of all four sides. Now I trace out roughly where my tea lights will be lining up through the top and I use my ruler to draw a nice square area for the fire pit. I'll use my X-Acto knife again to cut that area out and then I glue them together with some hot glue. While I'm rocking that hot glue, I'm gonna use it to secure my tea lights in place. I just coat the inside of the circles that I cut out for them and then press them into place. Now to add some detail to the fire pit. For this, I am going to be using disposable foam plates. As far as I can tell, these are made out of XPS foam, but they are cut very thin already, you know, like off the shelf because that's what they're for. So uh, this kind of saves us the need to have to mill down some really thin pieces of foam for detail. So I haven't really used these before, but I kind of want to try them out on a low pressure project like this just to see how they work. I started by cutting out a rectangle that was slightly smaller than the one I had cut out of foam core. This is going to add a nice decorative edge to the top of my fire pit. 
Before I glue that in place, I use my hot glue gun and just dump a bunch of hot glue through the top onto the edges of my tea lights just to make sure that they aren't going anywhere. I also use that topper as a guide to cut out a piece of clear plastic from an egg container to size. I put some hot glue on top of my tea lights and then I press that clear plastic into the trench on top of the fire. The goal here is to have this plastic piece be kind of like the catch-all that I can glue pieces onto that will eventually represent like the coals or the flames of the fire pit. It doesn't quite work as well as I had intended later on down the line, but we'll get to that later. Like I said before, I'm going to be using these disposable plates for the details. So one downside of these is that they have that raised lip around the edge. Great for using them as plates, but as far as crafting is concerned, that area is not really usable to us. So I used my scissors and I kind of prepared a couple of plates ahead of time by just cutting that area off. Now I'm going for a kind of cobblestone boulder look for the sides of my fire pit. And the most effective way I found to do this was to take my scissors and just hack up a whole plate into chunks and then randomly round them into unique shapes. Then once I had a good amount of those, I could start gluing them into place with hot glue. This is also how I hide that awkward gap I made when cutting out the holes for my tea lights. I struggled a bit with what to do on the corners, but I found that lining two pieces up was looking awkward and not working for me. So I actually just started taking one bigger rock and then bending it around the corner and letting the hot glue hold it into place. Once I was satisfied with the look of my cobblestone, I textured the whole thing with a tinfoil ball. Two notes. Uh, the first is that I obviously should have just textured all of my cobblestone pieces before I glued them to the fire pit. Uh, it's just easier to get a clean result and then you're not kind of like working around the more fragile edges of your kind of foam construction. The second thing is that I noticed while working with the uh, disposable XPS plates that they don't quite take the texture from the tin foil as well as regular uh, XPS does. I'm assuming this is because they have kind of like a glossy coat on them and I'm assuming that that gives them a little bit more like surface tension so they don't kind of get impacted by the tin foil in the same way. Uh, I don't really know what I'm talking about but I'm just that's my best guess. <laughs> it's not a big enough problem to make me stop using them but it is something to kind of keep in mind for future use. Now it's time to start assembling the structure for my spit and for this I'm going to use balsa wood. Uh, Matt over at the RP Archive, a channel that you should definitely check out, I'll put a link to it in the top right, uh, he uses balsa wood all the time in some really awesome creative ways and so I was inspired watching his stuff to try it out for myself. So I got myself a couple packs and I wanted to try and use it here. The balsa wood is really nice and soft and you can just cut it with kitchen scissors. So I cut out four lengths of it that are roughly two inches or so long and then I sand them down so that they are flush with each other. These will be the vertical sides of my triangles uh, for the sides of my spit. I also cut a couple of pieces that will eventually be the bases of the triangles to function as the top of my rotisserie spit and the key piece that lets this rotisserie actually rotate, I am using quarter inch long pieces cut from a plastic straw. I put this together in probably the silliest way possible at first, but here it is. I hold the two sides of my triangle straight up in place where I want them, and then I have my art director brush their connection point with super glue, and then put the piece of straw into place while she's climbing over my shoulders. Then she dabs the area with accelerant to save me from this awkward position. The straw piece didn't quite take on the first try, but it was good enough to hold the two pieces of balsa together, and then I could use that as a template to make the other side of the rotisserie. Now I can hold my base piece in place and mark out where it fits at the bottom and using my kitchen knife to cut away the excess. Then I just attach those together with more super glue. I take this chance to carve some extra character into them with my X-Acto knife. Now I need to make some base pieces to connect these two triangles. I cut up a couple more pieces of balsa to length using the pit itself as a guide. Then I glued them together with more super glue, making sure not to get any glue into the pit itself because I want this to be modular. Now that they are roughly together, I give some character to these base pieces and I have my art director strengthen the connection points with more glue while I hold the triangles upright. Now I can attach the pieces of plastic straw in piece. Now to tackle how I'm going to make this thing modular. I'm thinking magnets. 
but in order to use magnets, I'm gonna need something to hide them. So I take some more scrap pieces of foam core and I trace out my rotisserie unit on top of it. I cut that area out with an X-Acto knife and I texture it with some more tin foil. Then I use hot glue to attach it to my balsa wood and I trim away any excess with my X-Acto knife again. So I was thinking about how I wanted to add some coals to the fire pit and I was kind of mulling over in my, in my mind how I was gonna tackle that. And uh, when I came up with my idea, I realized I needed to kind of pre-prep this uh, so that I could have them ready when I needed them. So what I did here is I took a little container and I mixed some black paint with a bunch of my basing rocks. And then I dumped that out onto a piece of parchment paper so that it wouldn't stick and I kind of spread them out and set that aside to dry. So now I take my fire pit and I trace it out onto my parchment paper. And then I kind of use that as a guide uh, to, to help me figure out how big my flame should be. So I start tracing out some random flame shapes and using that as a guide so I know they will fit. I end up kind of drawing like a couple long lines of fire, but then a couple random fire shapes that I can kind of uh, use later on to kind of fill in any awkward gaps and give me a little bit more versatility. Once I feel like I have enough variety, I take my hot glue gun and I fill in those shapes with hot glue. Once those are dry, I peel them off, flip them over, and then use my hot glue to apply texture to the flat side that was stuck down before. Once those have dried a second time, I come back in with a pair of clippers and I clip off the tips of all of my flames. This is because the hot glue tends to have a, uh, a way of pooling. It doesn't really fill those small areas super well um, and it just kind of blobs out. And if you don't do this step, it kind of, you're gonna look like you have flame goop and not flames. So clipping those tips to make them look nice and sharp is really, really a crucial step here to make this look right. Okay, so that gave us enough time for our black coals to dry. So now I'm gonna take my fire pit and fill it with hot glue. It is here where I realized that I made a miscalculation. Even on low temp, my hot glue was hot enough to melt the plastic piece that I had glued in before, and it was shriveling and warping in place under this layer of hot glue. So I did it again. I cut out a new layer of plastic and I put it in place on top of this shriveled up melty one, and then I covered that one in hot glue and placed my black coals into it as it was drying. So here I was worried about accidentally adding too many coals and then having uh, those coals obscure the light too much and, and kind of defeat the whole purpose of having the tea lights in place. So while I was adding the coals, I turned on my tea lights so that I could kind of have a better idea of kind of how much they obstructed it and, and how it was gonna kind of net out. And then I just added coals until I felt like I had a good ratio. So by this time, my hot glue had mostly cooled, and so my coals were just being held in place by gravity. I didn't quite realize this yet, uh, so I moved on to the next step, which was I wanted to make my coals look like they are glowing. To accomplish this, I took out my dry brush and some vanilla paint, and then I gently dry brushed the coals to kind of give them white highlights on the edges. They started moving around on me here, and uh, it was a bit of a pain, but it was not uh, so much so that I couldn't proceed forward. Now to actually hold the coals in place, I just squirted some 50-50 uh, water white glue uh, combination onto the fire pit so that that would kind of hold, dry clear and, and hold the coals in place. Now I need to add the magnets to both my rotisserie A-frame and the fire pit itself. So I just kind of eyeballed where they line up and then marked those spots with my pencil. Then I cut out the holes for my magnets with an X-Acto knife and using hot glue and a toothpick with some sticky tack on the end, I press them into place. Now I will set those aside to dry before I drip more white glue all over myself and I'll move on to working on the actual kind of spit for the rotisserie. I'll take a bamboo skewer and sand it smooth with my sanding block. Then I'll test fit a couple of wooden beads to fit on the ends and trim it roughly to size for now. I'll glue one of those beads on for now with some hot glue. To make handles for the spit, I'm going to use some thick sculpting wire and bend it into a rough 90 degree angle. Then I'll cut it out and make a second one. 
Then I'll sand them both smooth and also sand the surface of the bead so that it will have more of a porous surface for the glue to bite into. To glue these together, I'm gonna to use some E6000, and that's because of the metal sculpting wire. E6000 is a really good glue for taking two kind of uh, different surfaces that are, don't take glue well, especially metal, uh, and, and make sure that they have a nice solid connection. I'll just apply the E6000 with a toothpick and then hold the two pieces together. Then I'll do the same thing for the other handle, and I'll set that aside, propped up with some scrap pieces of balsa to hold it together a bit. Once it's mostly set, I'll bulk out the connection points with some super glue, and then spray the whole thing with accelerant to help it get a nice quick hold. Now I can take my clippers and trim away any weird bulging bits of glue on that connection point. And then I can take one of my small sanding bits and just kind of sand it down to make it smooth. Now I'll prep my plastic and metal bits by painting them with a little bit of black primer. Once those are dry, it's time to make my prized hog. I'm gonna bust out all my sculpting tools and my milliput, and I'm gonna start mixing it together. Now, I'm by no means a great sculptor, but I just started by rolling a little sausage body and then some sausage legs and pressing them together. I smooth out the transitions a bit between those with my sculpting tool, and then I start pressing in some of the details for the hooves. I will also add some texture to the back and sides with the smooth end of my sculpting tool. Then I take a little ball of milliput and I start shaping it into a head with an open mouth. I add a couple of little ears to that head, and it just keeps squishing things around until they feel right. Once it's good, I press it onto the body and then smooth out the transition again. Once everything is looking and feeling right, I take a skewer and I press the bore through it to make a hole. Then I remove it and line my spit up and actually press it into place. While it's in place, I clean up any areas that I messed up by pressing it on and I add some more finishing touches, like an extra bulk around the neck, some more texture, a coiled little pigtail, and some little tusks. Now I'll leave that to set and dry. I guess it's not really called drying, it's just setting, reacting. It's a chemical reaction, so I guess it's just, I'll leave that to chemically react for a couple hours, and while I do that, I'll work on the handles. Okay, for these, I just put a dab of super glue onto the handle, and then I wet the end of my strip of paper in accelerant. Then I press those two pieces together, and once it's secure, I can then put white glue along the strip of paper and then wind it around on itself to create a nice handle on top of the metal. Then I just cut a couple tiny little circles of paper and wet them in some super glue and dab them into place on the ends of the handles. Now that that's finished, I can coat the rest of this piece that isn't metal or plastic with the good old black magic base coat. This is just black paint mixed with Mod Podge in a uh, pre-made container that I always have handy. This is great stuff because the Mod Podge and paint is really gonna help hold everything together and obviously it's a great base coat because it tanks paint super well. Once that's dry, I'm gonna add the bead to the other side of the spit and press it into place. And while doing this, I accidentally broke the side of my spit, so I'll just take a moment and repair that real quick. Okay, now I just glue the bead on and press it into place. Now I can just clip away any excess and then sand the nub smooth. And then lastly, I'll just clean up the breakage areas as well as the new bead and coat them with some more black magic base coat. All right, once that's dry, it is time to paint this thing up. I'm gonna start with the stone. And for this, I'm not really gonna do anything crazy. If you've seen my other videos, I have a classic stone recipe that I use for almost all of my stone pieces. It starts with a base overbrush of graphite. Then I overbrush random areas with dark taupe, and then highlight those same areas with a dry brush of light taupe. This gives the stone some variety in tone so that it's not all just flat gray. Then I dry brush the whole thing with gray, and dry brush some highlights on with suede. For an over the top final highlight, I will use some vanilla to hit the edges. For the wood, I started by painting it with uh, burnt umber and then brown and then golden brown and then I dry brushed with suede. But uh, after some deliberation later on, I realized I didn't really like that look. I wasn't very happy with it. So I'll come back and repaint that later. 
So I still don't have any silver craft paint due to the lockdown here in Canada. I have not been to the dollar store in freaking ages. So uh, in order to kind of compensate for that and make myself a gunmetal, I'm gonna do what I've done in my past few videos and mix together some metallic white that I have with black craft paint. And I just kind of noodle with that a bit until I get a nice gunmetal color that I'm happy with. And then I will use that color and coat everything that's metal on this. So we're talking the spit and we're talking the rings at the top of the rotis as well as the handle um, pieces that aren't the paper pieces. Then once that's coated, I mix up a lighter version of the same two colors to kind of create a highlight, and then I use that to dry brush onto the top edges of the metal pieces. Now for my first attempt at painting the pig. I attempt to wet blend these three colors, orange, yellow, and brown. This was a good idea in theory, but I'm approaching it in totally the wrong way for craft paints. First off, I didn't water down any of the craft paint, and I'm just using a brush that is way too flimsy. So in the end, my blends are not really smooth, and it ends up looking kind of sloppy. However, this does serve as kind of a decent base coat for round two. So once it had dried, I busted out my wet palette with the same colors, plus a little bit of vanilla for the tusks. I grabbed a decent brush this time, and I tried again. This time I tackled it with the same mindset I would use when painting a miniature, and I focused my brightest areas at the center mass sections of the bore. This helps the edges look nice and crispy. Once I was happy with the bright areas of the bore, I mixed in some black with my brown, and I started adding some contrast to the areas which would be darker, like the legs and the tips of the ears. Once I was happy with that, I worked on repainting the wood. For this, I just mixed together some brown, golden brown, and orange to create more of a natural wood tone. Once that was dry, I mixed together a brighter version of that same combination, and then dry brush highlighted all of the wood. I did that same thing one more time, this time with a little bit of vanilla in the mix. I let that all dry and set overnight, and then I came back the next day to do some oil paint washing. Okay, so for oil paints, uh, you don't need to be super big brain to figure this out, but there is one thing that you need to understand, and it is that water is no-go zone, no water allowed. However, you can use this for pretty much everything that you would use water for when working with acrylics. You wash your brush in water? No, you wash your brush in white spirits. You, you thin your paints in water? No, you thin your paints in white spirits. That's, that's it, you're an oil paint expert now. So for this, I am just mixing up different thicknesses of washes with my oil paints and my white spirits. One of these containers has black and brown oil paints, and then the other has black and green. I mess around with those for a bit to get the right consistency of spirits to paint. But once I'm happy with them, I grab a brush and I just start sloshing them onto my fire pit and spit. I start with the black brown wash and I use it on everything. The only thing I'm being careful about here is to make sure that I don't get any into the fire pit area itself. Then I come back with some of my green and black wash and I use it to add a bit more depth to some of the stone areas around the sides. Once I have everything covered, I'll take a little makeup sponge dampened with some white spirits and use it to pull the wash back off any areas that I want to be highlighted, like the edges of the fire pit or the edges of the individual cobblestones. I left that for the better part of a day to dry and then here's what it looked like. Now it's time to finally attach those flames that we made earlier. For this, I just use more hot glue along the bottom of the flames and then press them into place. Once I have my three main lines of flames in place, I'll test it real quick. Nice. Then I can just come back with the smaller pieces that I made and start inserting them where it makes sense to try and break up some of the uniformity of these flames. Okay. Perfect, I'm really digging that look. So as one final step, I want to add some color to my hot glue flames, but I want to make sure that I'm not covering up the uh, translucency of them too much and obscuring the light coming from the tea lights. So for this, I'm gonna use my India inks instead of paint. This is because the inks are really pigment rich, so you can get a nice strong hit of color without uh, the kind of opacity and, and uh, you know, uh, thickness that, a, that an acrylic paint would have. So I've never attempted this before and uh, paint 
has a tendency to have a hard time sticking the hot glue by itself. So I wanted to test the India inks first before I kind of potentially ruin my flames. So I just grab a spare hot glue stick and then I pour out uh, the inks that I intend on using, which are black, red, orange, and yellow. And then I just kind of paint on a quick, uh, quick dirty little gradient onto that stick to see if it, it kind of works. So here it is after a few minutes. Totally dry and it stuck pretty well to the hot glue. I was pretty satisfied with this result. It worked a lot better than I anticipated. It. So now I can just proceed with using that same method onto the flames themselves. I take my dry brush and I put yellow onto the brightest areas at the bottom of the flame. And then I switch over to orange and kind of work that transition up and then to red and then to black at the very tips of the flames, making sure to put it on very sparingly as I don't want to overpower the rest of this thing. And the lights still show through really nicely. That worked a lot better than I anticipated. I'm really happy with that result. And that's the complete build. Here's what it looks like in a few different setups. Well, that's it friends. That's all there is to this video. Thank you so much for watching. I'm excited to get back to doing some more crafts after that massive paint job that we did last time. I have a couple ideas floating around in my head for things that I'd like to tackle in future videos, so stay tuned for those. If you enjoyed this video, I have plenty of other crafting and painting videos that you can check out in the meantime while you wait for the next one. Have a good week, guys. We'll see you soon. I trace out my fire pit for scale, and then I kind of use that box to start drying out some rough flame shapes. And because I'm using my fire pit for scale, I know that these will... <laughs> it's all good. It gave me an excuse for a beer break.